الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواده ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذ تستغيثون ربكم فاستجاب لكم أني ممدكم بألف من الملائكة مردفين وما جعله الله إلا بشرى ولتطمئن قلوبكم به وما النصر إلا من عند الله إن الله عزيز حكيم In the previous session we talked about the battle of Badr or in fact the reasons that led towards the battle of Badr and we talked about the Kuffar of Quraysh coming out with the intention of fighting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'een on the other hand Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Medina Munawwara only with the intention of following that business group of Kuffar of Quraysh that was going from Syria to Mecca. Although we won't be able to finish the whole story regarding the Battle of Badr in this session, but at least I thought we should get somewhere where we can stop till after Ramadan and inshallah will continue from there on after the month of Ramadan. Badr is about 80 miles from Medina Munawwara. And it was named either after a person who was the first person to establish that village or after a well that was in there in that village that was called Badr. At that time, when the Battle of Badr took place, that was not considered to be a village or a res residential area. It was just a desert. But they had some fountains of water over there, and therefore travelers used to station over there. And of course, later on it became a small village, and it remained a village for almost... 1400 years and very recently that small village turned into a city now and nowadays Badr is a city is not just a village in our childhood Badr was a very small village a village where you may be able to take a whole round of the village walking within an hour. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of course he had no intention of having a war or fighting the kuffar. But then when they learned that the kuffar of Quraysh came with that intention, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the opinion of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa and they said, Ya Rasulullah, whatever you see, and whatever you ask us to do, we are with you. We would see this point again and again in the history. And as I said earlier, many times that when we are studying the seerah, we are not just studying some stories, we are trying to learn our lessons from the seerah. This is called fiqh sirah Understanding the sirah and getting our lessons from the sirah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You would always see that Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa were so obedient to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every matter that whenever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them anything they always put
put the full trust in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even in situations where normally our mind would most certainly give something totally opposite, will, give, will be giving us a totally different information and would be asking us our intelligence, our understanding, our knowledge, Everything would be telling us something totally opposite than what we would feel that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would like to do. But Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, subhanallah, their iman, their faith was so strong that whenever there was a conflict between what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted and what their minds are telling them, what their intelligence, what their understanding is telling them, they would always give preference to what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants. And this is of course a very important teaching of Islam. Ita'ah, obedience. There are so many ahadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized on this obedience, which always brings the nusrah, brings the help. And this obedience will always call, cause friction and disunity, and that will always cause fitness in the Ummah. This is always, there are hundreds of ahadith that talk about this. The Kuffar of Quraysh, they came and stationed at Badr, where they had some fountains of water, so what they did was they first, as they arrived there first, they took all those fountains, under, fountains of water under their control. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'in arrived there, they didn't get no water. But of course, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to help, then He does not depend on having a fountain or having a well or having an ocean. He can just open the doors from anywhere he wants. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran. وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَلْنِيُطَهِّرَكُمْ بِهِ That I send water from, for you from skies. It started raining very heavy. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een They made some holes and all the water gathered gather over there that was enough for all of their use. وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً He sends down the water from the skies for you people. That night Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent the whole night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, crying before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ali radiallahu anhu says, that we all had a, some sleep during that night, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was up for the whole night making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the night, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majma'een to the battlefield and pointing out to certain places, he said, Tomorrow, Utbah bin Rabi'ah will be killed at this place. Shaybah will be killed over here. Abu Jahl will be killed over here. Umayyah will be killed at this point. Pointing at exact points, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marked the places for Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majma'een that this is where the, this person would be killed. <coughs> Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een see that next day after the battle was over, when we went back to see, it was exactly the very same positions and places where those people, exact same person died and was killed. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een saw a lot of miracles during the battle of Badr. Many miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was good to strengthen their faith and their iman. And of course, at the same time, it was showing them the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم left Salat al-Fajr and after Salat al-Fajr he got three flags he gave one to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu the second one to Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu and the third one to someone from the Ansar Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een had built a small shed for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on one of the mountains on top of the hill. A shed is called Adish in Arabic language. And therefore, after that, people built a masjid over that place which is known up to now as Masjid al Arish. So up to this day, there is a masjid over there that is known as Masjid al Arish. That was the place where they had built that shed for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to rest under that place. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came out as the kuffar were getting ready, they are preparing themselves. As he looked at them, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, today Quraysh came out with its arrogance and pride to stop people from following your deen and to reject your prophet and to fight your prophet. Ya Allah, show us your help and fulfill your promise that you have made to us on helping the Muslims and the people of Iman. Then he was straightening the lines of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. There was a Sahabi whose name was Sawad ibn Ghaziyah radiyallahu anhu. After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished straightening the line, he saw Sawad ibn Ghaziyah radiyallahu anhu was a little bit ahead of the line. So he went back to him and with the back side of the arrow he hit him in his stomach, he pinched him in his stomach jokingly and he said your stomach is coming out, put it back. This was jokingly but Sawad ibn Ghaziya on the other hand he turns around and says Ya Rasulullah when you did this, it pinched me. And I got hurt. Ya Rasulullah, I need to take revenge. Right away, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved his sheet from the stomach and he said, okay, take the arrow. Sawad ibn Ghaziya radiallahu anhu kissed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's stomach. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is why I did it because I don't know if I would be able to see you after this or not. <coughs> the lesson that we learn, of course we know the love of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, incomparable. We can't even think of anything like that. But on the other hand, imagine just think of a situation when the commander-in-chief of an army is trying to straighten someone in the line or giving him the instructions and he pushes him a little bit or do something of that kind and that person turns around and says, I need to take a revenge from you. <coughs> Just think of that is happening somewhere, what will happen to that person? I'm sure next minute that person won't even be in existence. <clears throat> that tells us when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in that position, is still his attitude, his behavior, his akhlaq did not change. He's as humble as he was when he is in the masjid. It's not that now I'm a, I'm a different position. You must know who you're talking to now. 
And here I'm standing in front of the army, there are kuffar in front of us. I don't want to show my weakness. Whatever excuse we bring for ourselves, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while he's standing there in between the lines, he opens his stomach and he says to this person, come and take the revenge. This is subhanallah, this is nabuwa. These are the teachings of nabuwa where any normal person would fail right there. Although they seem to be very minor points, but they are extremely important points for those who can pay little attention to the severity of the situation and how critical the situation is. And for those who are there who would like to learn the lessons from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these small incidents, they really mean a lot. Because these are the positions, these are the situations where we normally would fail. And as soon as we fail in these situations, then we keep on seeing failures upon failure in the next stages to come. Akhlaq, morality, behavior, and understanding our position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, realizing that being in any position in this world does not give me the right to be unjust and to do wrong to others. Of course, this doesn't mean that this will open the door for every person that at any point we get up and say to the person, oh, here, I need to do this to you. That day you did this to me, so today I'm going to take revenge from you. There are many other hadiths that would talk about this, but the point I wanted to mention here is the humbleness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we learn, and especially when he's in that position. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he's trading in the lines of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa on the other hand, the kuffar are ready. At that time, the kuffar sent a person whose name was Umair ibn Wahab. This person was known as the Shaytan of Quraysh. We will talk more about him as we would be talking about the end of the battle or after the battle. But at this time, the Kuffar of Quraysh sent Umair ibn Wahab to go and see if there are, they see that there is such a small number here of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah and most of them are holding sticks in their hands. They don't even have a sword. So is it true that these people are really, these are the ones who are going to fight us? They can't even believe their eyes. So they thought it must be a plot. There must be another army hiding somewhere behind the mountains. And these people are just pretending that they are fighting us. As soon as it would stand, there would be someone else, some other armies that will jump on us all of a sudden. <coughs> they can't believe what's happening here. Most of the kuffar, or majority of them, are on horses, and some are on camels. And here, these people are standing on the, on the on ground, on their foot. And kuffar are so much equipped with weapons that for many of them, you can't see nothing of the body except with the eyes of the person. That's the only part of the body that you can see the eye of the person. And here these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi some of them, because their sheet, the upper sheet was so short that he can't even put a knot in it, so they even take the, they took the sheet out. So the upper part of the body has nothing on it. It's only one sheet that is covering from navel and to the knee or a little uh, lower than that. So they are looking at these people. A person who's standing in a battlefield, doesn't carry no shield in his hand, doesn't have no sword, he's carrying a stick, and he wants to fight. <laughs> so this is why they sent Umair ibn Wahab that go and look around. There must be some people hiding behind mountains. In fact, there must be an army that is hiding behind these mountains. Umair ibn Wahab went out to look. 
And after having a long round, he comes back and he says, uh, no, I didn't find, see no one there. These are the only people. But then he says to them, if this is true that there is no one else that is here to help them, this simply means these people are going to do their best. They are going to use their utmost power. Each of them would do the best to do something to hurt us. Because we are proud of our number and our weapons. And these people don't have none of these things. So each of them knows that he just depends on his own power and whatever he would do. This is of course a Kafir speaking. These Sahaba are depending on the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, then he says advising the Kuffar, advising his own people, he says this simply means if there are around 300 people over there, none of them is going to die before killing one of us. So 300 for 300, so even if 700 out of us are not, nothing happens to them and they go back alive, what have we achieved after losing 300 people of our, 300 of our people? Even if we win, losing 300 people, it's not a simple thing. So he says, my advice is, we should look into a way of just going back without a war. This is the shaitan of Quraysh that is speaking at that time. Later on, he became a sahabi, radiyallahu anhu. At that time, when he said these words, it was in the hearts of most of those people because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the fear in the hearts of the kuffar. Although they are large in number, they are well equipped, but the situation of the heart, that is the real thing that matters. And if a person is afraid, if there is fear in the heart, Allah puts the fear in their heart. Each of them is thinking it would be better if something happens and we just go back home safe. So, Hakim ibn Hizam, he was considered to be a very wise person. He went to Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, who was another wise person amongst Quraysh. Quraysh normally would go and approach Utbah ibn Rabi'ah for major issues and they would always consult him. So Hakim ibn Hizam went to Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and said to him, look, what Umair said is very true. And then we see no need now to fight them because we can see them, they really don't, they, they never came out to fight. They didn't come leave the town to fight us. And we came just to protect our people and the business group that was traveling. And they have arrived home saying, so what's the need now? What's the need of having a war? Utbah says, this is what I'm thinking too. And Utbah gets up on a higher place and he gives a lecture saying that all oh, people of Quraysh, we got what we wanted. Our people arrived home safe. And if we kill these people, even if we look at their situation, they can't fight us. Of course, we see that. Even if we kill them, what have we achieved? They are our own people. They are our relatives. They are our cousins. Some of us have our children there. Some of us have our fathers over there. Our brothers are there. Our uncles are there. What are we going to get by having a war with these people? Why not leave these people to do their work and deal with the rest of the Arabs? Why do we have to deal with them? Deal with the rest of the Arabs. If they win at the end, that is good. Our own brothers and our relatives have won. And we can see if we want to follow them or not at that time. And if they don't win, someone else kills them or does something to them, then of course we won't feel bad that we did this harm to our own brothers and our own, uh, to, uh, by our own hands. Let someone else do it. Most of the people, this is what they want. So now, yes, yes, this is what we need. Abu Jahl heard this. He comes out, he says, this is all nonsense. This is all being covered. And you people are scared. This is why you want to go back home. And don't listen to Utbah. 
All the Utbah is one of the leaders. Don't listen to Utbah. The only reason he wants to go back, because he, he sees his son on the other side, his son Huzaifa, radiallahu anhu, was Muslim. And he was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, it's only because of his son. This is why he wants to take all of us back. Today is our chance. We can just wipe them out. And whatever, whoever we can capture out of them, we will take them back so we can have good celebrations. We are not going to just go back like this today. We need some big celebrations and we need to wipe these people out. There is no way that we are going back. Anyway, he is the leader of the Um Kuffar. They don't want to just leave him. They can't just uh, go against his orders. So, now they all are prepared. And since now he put it in a way, this was his ways always. If you look at the uh, talk, how Abu Jahl used to talk, he would always find the weak points of a person and make him and insult him in public through that person's weak points. And then on the other hand, of course, this person would like to prove and he wants to prove uh, Abu Jahl wrong. No, no, this is not the reason. Really, I didn't mean this. And he knows also that he is not doing it for that reason. But he is touching those weak points so that this person would be offended and he would try to do something better now in return. This is always the way of Abu Jahl when we look at the seerah. So now, because he accused Utbah that you want to take us back because of your own son, Huzaifa. So now, Utbah was the first person to come out and challenge the Muslims. In those days, the way the battles used to start was that few people would come from one of the sides who considered themselves to be very strong and brave and they would challenge people from the other side. So initially it would stand with one to one. There will be few people, either one, two or three people that would be challenging people from the other side and each person would be fighting one person from the other side and whatever the outcome of this would be, then the rest of the armies will get involved too. So Utbah was the first person to come out and he brought his brother Shaybah and his son Walid. These three people came out and started challenging <coughs> the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. The word they used to use, Halmim Mubariz. Is there anyone to accept our challenge? So on the other hand, Three Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een from Ansar came out. Auf ibn al-Haris, Mu'awwidh ibn al-Haris, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiyallahu anhu. The Kuffar of Quraysh, they always considered themselves to be the higher level of Arabs. And of course, even all the other Arabs, they considered them of a higher level because they are from Quraysh. So Utbah, as these people, who are you people? We are the people of Ansar. No. We want people of our level. You people, what are we going to do with you people? You go back. We don't need you people. We need people of our level that can come out so that we can see that yes, we are fighting people with, of our caliber and our level. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked three of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een who were from Quraysh to go out. Hamza radiyallahu anhu, Ali radiyallahu anhu, and Ubaidah ibn al-Harith radiyallahu anhu. Hamza radiyallahu anhu went to Shayba, the brother of Utbah. Ubaidah ibn al-Harith went to Utbah himself, the person who started everything. And Ali radiallahu anhu, as he is the youngest of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa he was at that time in his 20s, early 20s. So he went to Al-Walid ibn Utbah. In no time, Hamza radiallahu anhu and Ali radiallahu anhu took care of their opponents. But still, 
the fight was going on between Ubaidah and Utbah. And both had injured each other. And of course, meanwhile, Ali and Hamza radiyallahu anhuma, they went to help Ubaidah radiyallahu anhu, and they killed Utbah ibn Rabi'ah also. So here, two of the great leaders of the Quraysh are gone. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, and Utbah's son, of course, who was not a leader, but he came out at that time too. This was enough to scare the rest of the kuffar. Right away in front of their eyes to see two of the leaders are gone. But Abu Jahl now right away he jumps and he says, Come on, these people because they just had to fight one to one, let's all of us do it together. And now we will show them what to do. And here he comes into the field and the war started between the two armies. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in that arij under the shed and he is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu continuously going between the battlefield and to where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was just to see if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was doing fine. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam <coughs> was making dua and insisting so much in begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on having the help of Allah that I had never seen him doing like that before. Of course, it's a very critical situation out there. And as he's making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's saying to Allah, Allahumma anjizli ma wa'attani, Ya Allah, fulfill the promise that you have made with me, and that is helping me and sending a help for me, and is making dua, and is begging Allah, and is crying before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, he said a word. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as soon as he heard this word, he just jumped. And he goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allahumma in tahlika halihi al-usabah. فَلَنْ تُعْبَدَ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَبَدًا Ya Allah, if the small group of people is wiped out, you will never be worshipped on this land anymore. Which means he's putting full emphasis, Ya Allah, this is my ummah at this time. This is the ummah of Khatam al nabiyyin Ya Allah, if this portion of the ummah is gone, then what is left from the Ummah? This is all what I have after working for so many years. Rasulullah Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu grabbed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the back. And this shows the connection. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, Qad akthart al-ilhaha ala rabbik. You insisted too much in making this dua. And you know, Ya Rasulullah, that Allah for sure will be fulfilling his promise. How when alayka ya Rasulullah? Ya Rasulullah, take it easy and take it easy in your dua. Ya Rasulullah, I can't see this cry anymore. If this is the situation of Abu Bakr, this was not the situation of Abu Bakr alone. There were many other people who were sharing the very same feelings as of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and we see the feelings of Abu Bakr because he was there and then there was another Sahabi, Sa'ad ibn Mu'az radiallahu anhu to narrate the whole incident to us that this is what I have seen, I had seen going under that shed at that time between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. But, as I said, there is a large group of people who is sharing the same feeling with Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Do you know who were those people? Malaikatullah. The angels. The angels are sharing the same feelings and they are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow them to go out there for the support. To go out and do something. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after this, 
he stopped and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam putting his head down after a short while he lifted his head up and said, Abu Bakr, I have a good news. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have sent the angels and I see Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam riding his horse and coming down to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al-Kareem, Istastaghithuna rabbakum fastajaba lakum anni mumiddukum bi alfim min al-malaikati murdifeen. Remember the time when you were seeking the help of your Lord. You are seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he answered your prayer that I will help you through angels, uh, through 1,000 angels that will come to you continuously. And after 1,000, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increased the number to 3,000 and to 5,000. What was the need of sending so many angels? One was enough. Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam all by himself was sent to the nation of Luth, picked up the whole town and turned it upside down. Why so many angels? During the battle of Badr, Shaitan knew that this is very important. This battle is very important and it's extremely important for the kuffar to win today. According to Shaitan. And therefore he came in the form of a human being and that was a leader of a clan called Bani Mudlij. He took the form of the leader of the clan of Bani Mudlij whose name was Suraqa bin Malik. And he brought a lot of other shaitans with him as they were the people of Bani Mudlij. So shaitan came in a form of a human being, with all the other shayateen with him, they all took the form of human beings. And he came and he held the hand of Abu Jahl. That Abu Jahl, we are here with you to support you today, as he is Suraqa bin Malik. I'm here to support you today. And look, all of my army is here behind you. And Abu Jahl looks back, such a huge army behind him. So as the kuffar saw shayateen in the form of human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to bless Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een to see the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore he did not send malaika angels in their original form that no one can see them. He wanted to have a special blessing for Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een where they see malaika angels riding their horses and coming down into the field and they are in a form of a human being. Sahaba know that they are angels but they can see them as human beings. Imagine how happy they were when they saw that Sahaba malaika are coming riding their horses and they are coming and getting into the field. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa as they describe the malaika the same. We saw people coming into the field with noon. Initially, we never thought that they are malaika. And they all had, they, they, all of them, they had yellow imama on their head. Some of the narrations, they say that they had white and black imamas also, some of them. But those narrations are not as strong. The strongest narrations are the ones that talk about Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa having yellowish imama on their head. This also tells us the importance of the imama, that at that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending the malaika and in that dress. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out of the place where he was resting, which means and where he was making dua. And he took a handful of dust and saying, Shahat al Shahat al wujuh Shahat al wujuh which means these faces are cursed, are destroyed, 
and he takes that fist of dirt and he throws it towards the kuffar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about in Quran, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَا The time when you threw the dust, you are not the one who threw it. I'm the one who threw the dust. Subhanallah, look at this closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the action that was performed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah says, I was doing it, but I did it through your hand. Which means, if the real doer was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what was the result of it? What can a handful of dust would do in, uh, to such a large army? And especially for a person who's standing far from the army. That dust, as it went out, it got into the eyes of each and every one of the kuffar. It got into their eyes. Those of them who were able to go back safe, then, uh, they made it safe back, they tell us, and they became Muslims later on, they tell us that we don't know where the dust came into our eyes, and we were just rubbing our eyes, we couldn't see anything, it was so painful that we couldn't do nothing else but to be rubbing our eyes, and then they tell us, those who were with the Kuffar at the time, with Quraysh at the time, when they became Muslims, they tell us, that as we are rubbing our eyes, we see I, a person standing next to me, he is killed. Who killed him? I can't see the person. I just heard someone coming. I don't see the person. Kuffar were not able to see the malaika. Sahaba Ridwan Allah saw them. But most of the Kuffar, they did not see them. So, now he says that I see the person standing next to me. He just fell down. What happened to him? I don't know. And this really scared us so much that we started throwing our weapons and started running away. And here, Malaika are killing these kuffar. Sahaba Ridwan Allah tell us that on that day, as we were, just we would move our sword, as we would lift the sword, we would see the head of the people is down. There was no even need after the malaika came and after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa threw the dust, there was no need even to hit the person. Just lifting the sword, the next step is the person is down. This was all malaika, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the leaders of Quraysh that was killed there were many leaders, inshallah, we'll talk about them later on. But one of the leaders of Quraysh that was killed during the battle of Badr was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf is a person who really did not want to come to the battlefield. And the reason for that was, he had a friendship with Mu uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'az radiallahu anhu, who was the leader of Ansar. Once, before, much before the battle of Badr, Sa'ad ibn Mu'az radiallahu anhu went to Makkah Mukarramah and he was doing tawaf, Umayyah bin Khalaf was with him to protect him because he's Muslim. There was a fear that any of the kuffar would attack him at any time. So while he's doing the tawaf, Abu Jahl came out and he asked Umayyah bin Khalaf, who is this? The one who's doing the tawaf. He says, this is the leader of Ansar of the people of Medina, Sa'ad ibn Mu'az. So Abu Jahl started cursing at Sa'ad ibn Mu'az radiallahu anhu. Sa'ad ibn Mu'az radiallahu anhu got upset. And he said, if you continue doing this, and if you say one more thing, I will stop your pe you people from passing through our town because that is the place where they had to pass through when going to Syria. I would make sure that you people will have no business through Syria, through our town and you would never be able to go to Syria. So Umayya bin Khalaf says to Sa'ad ibn Mu'az, Sa'ad, lower your voice. Your, your voice is too high. Don't you know that you're talking to our leader? So Sa'ad ibn Mu'az says to Umayya, you're asking me to lower my voice, but you don't know what's happening to you. I don't care about your protection because I know one day you would be killed on the hand of some of the believers. 
As soon as he heard it, he said, how do you know this? The topic changed right away. His concern, his worry changed. How do you know this? And he heard what he didn't want to really hear. Sa'ad ibn Mu'az says to him, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that. Now, he's scared. His, the color of his face is changing. Did you really hear it? You hear Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying it himself? Did you hear it yourself too? He said, yes, I did hear him. I heard Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying it. <coughs> Sa'ad, please tell me, did he say that that will happen in Mecca or out of the Mecca? He said, nothing like that. I don't know nothing about that. All he told us that you will be killed on the hands of some believers. He started shaking. Because he knows whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it always true. There, there is no doubt about it. So he goes back to his home. The wife sees him shaking, scared. She asked him, what happened? And he tells us the whole thing. She is scared too and she says to him, make sure that Mecca is a protected place. Here we are under protection, we have all the people with us. Make sure you never leave the town anymore. At the time of the battle of Badr, he remembers what Sa'ad bin Mu'az had told him. So he says, I'm not going. Abu Jal, and as we talked about Abu Jal, his ways, so he kept on insisting, insisting. And finally he says, you know what? I know that there are a lot of people that are scared to go out. And a lot of people are very covered. And they are hiding their fear with different excuses. So okay, if you want to stay here, stay. And we don't mind having one more in addition to all the women that are here. There is one more we can say, okay, this is also a woman. We will consider you as a woman here. Even this didn't work too well with Umayyah bin Khalaf, who is too scared. So, Abu Jahl promises him to give him the fastest running camel. That here we will keep that camel with you. Come out, and whenever you see that there is no need for you to be with us anymore, you just come back. And even in the battlefield, you keep this camel with you. This is yours now. Umayyah had no choice but to go with them. And this is exactly what happened. As they are in the battlefield, Umayyah is scared. He knows something is going to happen now. And he would just like to find a way to go back as soon as he can. So, as the Malaika came and the dust in the eyes of, of the Kuffar, the first thing Umayyah thought, let me run away. He sees his own people getting killed right and left. And right there he sees Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. He had a friendship with Abdul Rahman ibn Awf in the days of uh, Jahiliyyah. So he says to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, please help me. On the other hand, he sees someone that really just we may, no, I don't you want to use no, uh, words that are not proper to be used in the seerah, but it really scared him to see that person. You know who that person was? Bilal radiallahu anhu. This is the person who used to torture Bilal in Makkah Mukarramah, Umayyah bin Khalaf. And all the difficulties and hardships that Bilal radiallahu anhu went through in Makkah Mukarramah that we read about and we heard of, it's because of Umayyah bin Khalaf. Bilal radiallahu anhu sees Umayyah bin Khalaf and he knows and Umayyah knows that since Bilal has seen me, there is no way for me that I'll make it out of this place. So he runs towards Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and he says, Bilal is coming, Bilal is coming. And next moment they see that Abdul Rahman ibn Awf says, you know, I don't think I'll be able to do nothing quickly. Lay down and he lays, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf lays down on top of him to help him, to support him, to protect him. Hopefully, later on he can convince him to 
accept the deen of Allah. Bilal radiallahu anhu sees that Umayyah is under protection now and is covered by Abdurrahman ibn Awf. So he says, oh people of Ansar, look, this is the person who did all of that to me that you heard about it. And now today he's under protection. I can't accept this. The Mu'addin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Khadim of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is calling. Who is going to refuse to answer his call? So all the people of Ansar, as soon as they heard it, they get around there and some of them are lifting Abdurrahman a little bit and they're poking their swords into Umayyah bin Khalaf. <coughs> and finally, this is how they killed Umayyah bin Khalaf. While he was under Abdurrahman ibn Auf. They cut him into pieces. And that was upon the call of Bilal, Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu. <coughs> and we know that the worst enemy of Islam of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Jahl, the leader of all the kufr, was also killed during the battle of Badr. Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu says, as the battle was going on, I saw two young people standing next to me. One's name was Mu'adh ibn Afra. And the other one's name was also Mu'adh, Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn Jamuh. Some of the histories mention one more name, and that is the brother of Mu'adh ibn Afra, whose name was Mu'awwith ibn Afra. So if that person was there, then it would be Mu'adh ibn Afra, Mu'awwith ibn Afra, and Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn Jamuh. Mu'adh ibn Afra and Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn Jamuh, one to the right and one to the left of Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu, and each of them is whispering to Abdurrahman ibn Auf in such a way that he doesn't want his partner, the person on the other side, to know the answer. He says, uncle, can you tell me who is Abu Jahl? Son, what do you want to do with him? I heard he curses at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to teach him his lesson today. The person on the next, on the other side, he whispers to me, says, Uncle, uncle, do you know who is Abu Jahl? Same question. And while I'm talking to them, I see Abu Jahl and I point it to them. I said, look, that person that's going over there, that is Abu Jahl. And of course, he has his uh, guards uh, around him to protect him. His own son, Ikrima, who was considered to be a person who was equivalent, that he was considered to be equivalent to 1,000 people with his power and his uh, expertise of the of war. There were some people in the Quraysh, they were known to be by themselves equivalent to 1,000 people. But this is what they used to call them whatever that means, but they used to call them that these people are equivalent to a thousand people. There is a list of those people, especially uh, a list of 30 of them is narrated in some of the books also. So, Akrima, the son of Abu Jahl, was one of them, and who is at this time with the Kuffar, and subhanallah, later on he became Muslim, Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiallahu anhu. And we see in the days when uh, there were wars against the Roman and the Persian Empire, Akrima radiallahu anhu was one of the great people who had uh, some great achievements over there. And sometime Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, when he wanted only few people that he could trust with him, uh, Akrima bin Abu Jahl radiallahu anhu was one of the very selected people. So, Abu Jahl is going there in the battlefield, but it's the same situation. Fear, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the fear in their hearts, and dust in their eyes, and the malaika killing right and left, and these people can't even see people approaching them, as malaika are approaching them and killing them. These two young people, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu says, as soon as these two young people saw Abu Jahl, they rushed to Abu Jahl, and... They attacked him, Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn Jamuh. 
was the person who was able to cut the leg of Abu Jahl. And after that, of course, other people started doing whatever they could, but as he had his supporters around him, they started supporting Abu Jahl and they protected Abu Jahl after this. But his legs are cut now and he's down on the ground. Mu'adh ibn Abdul al Jabur, as he attacked Abu Jahl and he was able to cut the legs of Abu Jahl, on the other hand, Akrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, he attacked Mu'adh on his shoulder and he cut his shoulder with the exception of a little piece of the flesh that was holding the shoulder into or the hand attached to the body. This young Mu'adh, he goes back because now his hand is just moving. He has no control over it. He's cut, most of the part is cut down with a little portion of it that is holding it. So he feels that he's going, this thing is preventing him from doing what he's supposed to do. So he goes back, he puts his hand that is hanging, he puts it under his leg and he pulls his shoulder up to take the, uh, his hand out of his body. This is the promise what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made in the hadith that the pain in that field is just like when a pin pinches you. Just like when you have, a, uh, you have to take a needle. This is just, this is the pain. So, after that the battle continued finally until when the rest of the kuffar ran away, 70 of them were captured and 70 were killed. 70 killed and 70 captured. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time asked the Sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa jma'een that who knows what happened to Abu Jahl and where is Abu Jahl? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu went out to look and he sees Abu Jahl laying down on the ground and he is still alive. But with his legs cut, most of the blood came out of the body. So he's almost there, but still he's alive. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, I went and I stood on his chest. Abu Jahl says to me, you're standing on the highest position in the world. <laughs> arrogance to its peak, subhanAllah. Look what arrogance do to people. <coughs> He's dying. He's suffering. And he says to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who is standing on the chest, he said, you're standing on the highest position because you're standing on my chest. Then he says to him, what do you think you want to do to me? He says, you know what I'll do to you. I'll cut you into two pieces. He says, okay, just make sure when you cut my neck, cut it from the lowest possible point, as close to the chest as possible. So when people will look at my head, they will see it a very high head with a long neck. Arrogance. Then he says, go and tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that even today I hate you as much or even more than I hated you ever before. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa got this message, he said, my Fir'aun was worse than the Fir'aun of Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. Fir'aun of Musa alayhi salatu wassalam at the time of his death, when he was dying, he said, La ilaha illallah. آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلِ وَأَنَا مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He says, oh, I believe in the same Lord of Bani Israel, I'm a Muslim. But my Fir'aun, even at the time of death, he is saying, no, I hate you and I don't want to be a Muslim. Worse Fir'aun than the Fir'aun of Musa alayhi salatu wassalam. After this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam Asked the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een to gather all the bodies of the kuffar and throw them in one of the empty wells that was over there. This was the end of these kuffar that were killed as far as the ones that are captured and what happened to 
Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, those who were murdered, how many of them, their position in Islam, inshallah, we will talk about these things in the next sessions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them the highest status in Jannah and through them, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us also. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.